Shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall ser serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even as a blessing in the midst of the land. Isaiah knew a lot about the connections between the Near East and Egypt. He was writing during one of the long periods when Israel was desperately trying to survive by playing off one against the other. Uh, most of the prophets favored Syria or Mesopotamia uh, when they had to choose, although some saw Egypt as deliverance. Isaiah in this passage invokes a very rare hope of uh, actual cooperation. Anyway, the Sinai and the sea routes were always the highway that linked Africa and Eurasia. Uh, it was the major route by which humans got out of Africa in the first place, you know, a couple million years ago. Uh, it, remains, it remained a major link till air travel. So in this 15 minute paper, it's impossible to give even an outline summary of the whole thing. So I'm going to concentrate on a couple of uh, topics that see, around the time when Eurasia and Africa got into serious contact over that highway. Uh, Fortunately, there are others here who know a lot more about Africa and its connections with the world system than I do. So, uh, yeah, let's put that down. Uh, it seems reasonable to deal with uh, origins of agriculture and how that spread around and then something about the contact period when the Eurasian and Egyptian systems really did sort of fuse. Um, agriculture was invented in the Near East about 10,000 uh, years BCE. Uh, more and more evidence points specifically to the area in South Turkey on the Syrian frontier. Uh, there's uh, certain, uh, they've certainly located the origin of chickpeas to a very specific point there. Uh, origins of several kinds of wheat are up in that area. Uh, barley seems to have been domesticated not too far off. Uh, not long afterward, management of wild sheep and goats merged into outright domestication with cattle and pigs following soon. Milking begins about 6500 BCE in the Near East, about 5000 BCE in Egypt. Uh, and then grapes and wine got into Egypt from uh, the far eastern shores of the Black Sea. And beer, uh, heaven knows, maybe the Egyptians had invented beer and maybe they had it a long time ago, but brewer's yeast, uh, as we know it today, came in also from the Black Sea area. Uh, Egypt gave back the cat. Uh, the cat's an Egyptian domesticate for religious as well as mousing reasons. But the first estimate, the first record we have of a domestic cat is in Cyprus at uh, 7,000 BCE. Uh, the cat looked wild, but there aren't any native cats on the island and they can't swim that far, so somebody brought it. And it must have been tamed in Egypt by then. Um, then Egypt later gave the world the donkey, and there's a strain of cattle that was domesticated in the Sahara somewhere, which doesn't seem to have gotten out of Africa, but it may have merged in. So the Egyptians gave back a lot of stuff. And this is crossing, you know, the wheat, barley, beer, wine, all that stuff is crossing from the Near East to Egypt, and the donkey and cat are going back the other way, long before we have any kind of record at all of contact. So we just don't know how that happened. Uh, and by the time the ancient Israelites managed to get out of Israel, uh, out of Egypt, uh, if they if they did, I mean, heaven knows whether that story has any truth. But I love the story. The, the first documented complaint of the troops about the food: We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. <laughs> uh, all those are Near Eastern crops. They're not native to Egypt. Uh, except the manna, which is the gum of certain desert plants. Uh, nothing shows contact better than crops, uh, but in the meantime, Israel, I mean, Egypt remained a very African civilization. It was originally and remained at core an African society that came from the south and maintained southern roots and contacts. This is attested by the vast pantheon of animal and animal humanoid gods, including such pan-African favorites as the crocodile. Uh, the art styles are distinctive and show similarities to the much older rock art of the Sahara. Um, language is another interesting point. Ancient Egyptian is related to the Semitic languages of the Near East, but is not one of them. Uh, and all that phylum, the Afroasiatic phylum, comes from southern Ethiopia and is fair, it, you know, it got into the Near East about 4,500 years ago. 
Uh, I'm emphasizing these African links because it's too common to say, uh, or at least talk as if Egypt was not really African but more Near Eastern. Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, all signs, or uh, Cyprian Broodbeck says for the Delta, all signs point to a unilateral direction of influence from south to north. In the final assessment, the strident message is one of political and cultural annexation from the African interior over this corner of the Mediterranean coast in the fourth millennium BCE. Well, writing was then independently invented, probably around 3200 BC. Uh, there's no similarity between ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics and the early Mesopotamian cuneiform, uh, so it was seen to be independent invention. We don't know. Um, anyway, to get to when the systems fuse, which is what I'm rather more interested in today, uh, uh, Dr. Wilkinson here has uh, dated the fusion of Egypt with the central PMN, as they call it, the Pharaoh Thutmose's invasion of Syria around 1505 BCE. Uh, and I think that's a perfect date. I mean, uh, this is when the Egyptians start bothering the Israelis and, and start getting called bad names, and especially Israelites who cooperated with the Egyptians get called some really bad names in the older books of the Bible. This was, final by a, uh, this was followed by 150 years of further incursion, peaceful and military, <coughs> including the establishment of tributary relations. Uh, and earlier than that, you'd actually had some uh, rather violent integration of systems when the Hyksos, which is a Greek corruption of the Egyptian Hekakasut, rulers of foreign lands, got in in the 17th century BCE. Uh, trade became important early, uh, and it started out with luxury goods, obviously, but cedar timber from Lebanon became critical to uh, ancient Egypt in very early times. Uh, trade leap forward after 1500, uh, Egypt, Egypt's adventuring in Palestine and neighboring areas was partly to secure those cedars, as well as to reduce invasion of the Hyksos type. The cedars of Lebanon were really a critical industrial good for the whole Near East, from Mesopotamia to the upper, utter, for, to the upper oil, aisle, Nile, upper Nile. Uh, cedar wood is extremely good wood, and there, you know, of course there's no wood in the desert at all. Ancient Egypt had some palm trees and acacias and stuff, but nothing that was really worth much. So you had to get those cedars. The Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, the Sumerian Epic from about 2500 BC or so, uh, centers on a huge expedition by Gilgamesh and his sidekick Enkidu to wrest control of the cedars from the guardian of the cedar forest, portrayed as a one monstrous wild man known as Humbaba. A recently discovered fragment of the epic shows that Humbaba enjoyed the bird songs and animal sounds of the forest. He was a real forester. It's an important finding. It shows that Humbaba was not a fictional monster, but a trope for the very real guardians of the forest, the human beings who enforce sustainable forestry so rigorously that there still are cedars on Lebanon, in spite of the, in spite of the fact that it's a very small forest and it was constantly being raided and attacked and so forth and overexploited. Countless real men and women must have died as Humbaba did to protect those cedars. <clears throat> One of them is actually known to us by name. The prophet Nehemiah wanted to repair, around 500 BC, wanted to repair Jerusalem and asked his king for a letter unto us of the keeper of the king's forest that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. Uh, meanwhile, the ancient Egyptians depended on cedar for decent uh, sea-growing boats and for building their wonderful temples. My point is to emphasize the vital importance of the cedar trade. An amazing insight into the early days of the joined world system was uh, provided by the discovery of 350 tablets at El Amarna, the capital city of Akhenaten in the uh, 1300s BCE. It was abandoned by his death. Uh, fell because of his radical religious reforms. So, you know, the city was just sort of preserved. You know, the sand of the desert covered it, and it's there still. Uh, the tablets are in Babylonian language and cuneiform script. They're diplomatic messages back and forth between Egypt and the Levantine and Mesopotamian states, and even as far afield as Anatolia. They record a very complex world of strategies, both military and martial. The Egyptians wanted to stockpile princesses for security reasons. Hopefully nobody would want to go to war with their own princess and her husband. More to the point, the letters show that the princesses acted as diplomats, not to speak of their spying possibilities. 
Uh, Near Eastern kings wanted to, but rarely, if ever, could marry Egyptian ones. The letters include a great deal about uh, tributes and so forth, and some small Near Eastern states kept constantly and desperately begging Egypt for financial and military help. In a few cases, we, can, in, we get increasingly desperate messages from embattled city-states and then sudden silence. One can only lament the tragedy so mutely attested. Uh, they also kept begging for Egyptian princesses, and the Egyptians would try to palm them off with some serving girl, and they would frequently spot the dodge and get mad. Um, another dramatic snapshot of the trade in this period is the Ulaburan shipwreck, a wreck from 1325 BCE of a ship carrying a cargo that ranged from Sudanese black wood, acacia wood, and elephant and hippo ivory to uh, copper from Cyprus. Greek jars, Egyptian glass idols, Levantine pottery, and assorted other goods show that a single boat could carry both precious and staple goods from every part of the East Mediterranean world. The main cargo was fully 10 tons of copper and one ton of tin, which perfectly reflects the 10 to 1 ratio uh, in bronze of the time. Another snapshot of a completely different realm for information, all of, for uh, Teresa and others who are working on these information networks, is provided by poetry. Akhenaten, uh, he of, you know, tried to start monotheism, first monotheist in the world, as for, well, in the civilized world, whatever that means. Uh, his <laughs> Hymn to the Sun is one of the greatest poems of any age or time anywhere in the world. <clears throat> And it was ripped off shamelessly by whoever wrote Psalm 104 of the Bible. I wish I could give the whole text. Here's something. Um, Akhenaten, your appearing is beautiful on heaven's horizon, O living Aten, who initiated life. As you shine forth in the eastern horizon, you have filled every land with your beauty. When you set on the western horizon, the land is in darkness and uh, as if in death. Among those asleep in their chambers, heads covered, not one eye can see another. Every lion sallies forth from its lair, and all snakes bite. Darkness is a tomb, the land is silent. Day dawns, you rise on the horizon, uh, you shine as the sun disk, and so forth. Uh, every road lies open at your appearing. Fishes in the river leap up at your presence, your rays reach into the great sea, the chick in the ebb cheeps in its shell. Now listen to Psalm 104. Thou makest darkness and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. The sun ariseth, they gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work and his arbor and labor until the evening. So is this great wide and sea wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships, there is that Leviathan who is made to play therein. These wait all upon thee that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. Uh, these are only the clearest of many parallels in two very long poems. It seems fairly obvious that the psalmist knew Akhenaten's hymn very well. Uh, this is not the only parallel uh, among all these documents. Uh, there are in uh, Tel Amarna also a vast number of papyri that were found written in Egyptian in various forms of sloppy little kid hieroglyphics and so on, including everything from love letters by schoolboys to their girlfriends to laundry lists. You can actually literally find out how much it cost to get your underwear washed in Egypt in 1325 BC. Uh, one of the amazing things about this is that literacy was so widespread. Uh, somehow we did not expect the ancient schoolboys and laundresses to write fluently. <laughs> they did. Um, Anyway, uh, trade goes on, and trade goes on, and then it's worth saying a little bit about uh, the Roman Empire spice trade, which is another, yeah, three minutes, another huge leap forward for uh, integration of the systems. Rome was trading, of course, for spices all over the place. Uh, James Miller, uh, noting that, well, let's see, this is from Sip uh, James Miller showed that spice trade was enormous and long-lasting, this was challenged by Patricia Crone, but it's clear that uh, Miller was right. Subsequent investigations by archaeologists at Varenike on the Red Sea coast show that, in fact, the spice trade was enormous. They were, in fact, herding elephants over the overland crossing from the Nile to Varenike, which is one of the most god-awful desert crossings in the world, and loading them on ships to send to somewhere or other to trade for spices. Uh, I can't imagine how they did that. Um, Anyway, so what are we to make of, this, of these few brief snapshots of the past? One lesson is that L.S. Hartley was only partly right when he wrote the past as a foreign country. They do things differently there. 
<laughs> it may be a foreign country, but it sure is a lot like this one. The El Amarna letters read pretty much like Hillary Clinton's infamous emails. <laughs> <laughs> they really do. <laughs> the Amarna documents about school kids, laundry, bread, and repairing the roof could come from any American small town today. They point that literacy was far more deep and widespread and deeply rooted than we used to think. Uh, this blends into the perception that trade and contact were far more expensive than basic to life than we used to think. One of the nice things about this business is you uh, have your neat systems in order and you think, oh, there was very little staple trade, it was all luxury goods, uh, and then you find the Ulamborong shipwreck and you know, you're blown to hell. Um, every time they find a new shipwreck, it turns out that there was far more heavy, long distance trade and staple goods than we thought. Um, the spread of domestic plants and animals, including cats to Cyprus 7000 BC, proves that contact of basic staple things was very extensive way early. Uh, in terms of our working group standards for judging systemic connections, there's no question that after 1500 BC, or really after 1600, Egypt was politically and militarily tied to the Near East. Uh, but the proposal that 5% of the bulk goods should come to or from a target country seems a bit excessive under the circumstances. I'm not sure whether I, you would count 5% of vitally important structural timbers, in which case it's clear, you know, they were getting their cedars of Lebanon, but if it's 5% of all bulk goods, no, Egyptian, Egypt never got 5% of their bulk staples from anywhere. I don't think they do it now, except for oil. Um, but what we do have is evidence of an enormous amount of trade. Egypt was importing tons and tons and tons of copper, tons of tin, tons of cedars of Lebanon wood, uh, tons of all kinds of other stuff. Uh, and there, as far as precious goods go, they were getting stuff from, uh, you know, getting masses and masses of lavish lazuli from eastern Afghanistan. So, the moral to all of this is that first there was much more contact early than we thought. Second, you have to look very closely at some very small local indicators to find that out. And uh, so very thank you very much. I'm glad to have everybody here.